So um, this morning, we're going to be finishing off um, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. But um, before I begin, as I normally do, I just want to thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to, to fellowship with us and to be here to hear God's Word. But the same goes for those watching and listening. There's a purpose and reason for you hearing this message, and I really believe that God's Word is going to do its work. And uh, just have to allow it to, to permeate, to, 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 you got to hear it, move all distractions, and, and let it do its work. God's Word is powerful, and I'll be speaking more on that today. And so I titled today's message, The Powerful Impact of God's Word. Now, those in the education system have observed that, the one, that one of the differences between those who do well academically and those who don't lies in the student's attitude. Students who want to do well in order to please their parents, teachers, or even themselves usually are pretty successful. On the other hand, those who don't care about their studies typically have difficulties. And you see, whatever we do in life and how well we do it is linked to our desires and our motives. Now, so far in this first section of chapter 2, Paul has elaborated on two primary motives for an effective Christian, to want to please God and to want others to please God. And as we discovered in last week's message, the first motive is foundational for the second Point being that the wellspring for everything in the Christian life comes from a person's desire to please God. Now, in light of this, a couple of questions arise. The first being, how can people acquire the desire to please God if they don't have it? And the second, if we have begun to have such a motive, how can we allow that motive to increase. Well, in this first section we'll be reading, Paul is going to do, we're going to see Paul explaining a few things. He's, he is going to be explaining how people can have, a, can have sincere motives to please God. He's also going to be speaking about the powerful impact of God's Word, the powerful impact it had on the Thessalonian church, the Thessalonian Christians, um, the powerful impact it had on those who wanted to do him harm and wanted to do the gospel harm. And also, we're going to be looking in this, in this last part of the chapter. He's going to be telling the believers at Thessalonica about his sincere desire to see them and to fellowship with them, but how he was hindered to do so. Again, because of the Word of God. And so that's going to be the focus here. How to have a sincere desire to, uh, to please God and powerful impact of God's Word. So let's pray and ask the Lord to speak powerfully to us this morning as we get into His Word. Heavenly Father, uh, you're so good. You're so amazing. We praise you and adore you for being just the one and only true God. There are many little G gods, Lord, but you are the only one. You're the only one that matters. You're the only true God. You're, you give life, Lord. You give mercy, give love. Lord, and every day you shower us with those, with those wonderful blessings. Thank you for your grace. 
Thank you for all you've done. And so now as we get into your word, Lord, I, I pray that it will have a powerful impact. I pray that uh, the people here and those watching will see the effects it can have on a person's life. The, the powerful and beautiful effects it can have on their lives. So, Lord, I, I just ask you right now to remove any distractions, Lord, anything that's keeping us, keeping our minds busy, preoccupied, those things that have kept us from really focusing on you this whole entire week. And may we just sit right now at your feet and hear your word. Your beautiful, wonderful, inerrant word. Fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Keep us safe. And let us hear from you now. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. The Word of God says, This is why we constantly thank God, because when you received the Word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as, hum not as a human message, but as, that, as it truly is, the Word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. Since you have also suffered the same things from people in your own country, just as they did from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. They displease God and are hostile to everyone by keeping us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. As a result, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit. And wrath has overtaken them at last. Back in chapter 1, verse 5, Paul had brought up how the gospel he brought to the Thessalonians, or that brought to Thessalonica, came with power, came with the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, here now, the apostle picks up on that theme by reminding them how they responded to the preaching of the gospel. Paul begins here by expressing how he and his companions constantly thank God when the Thessalonians received the message, when they heard it, they didn't, um, when the Thessalonians received the message, they heard it, they didn't receive or uh, welcome it as a human message, but as it truly is, the Word of God. Now, just to be clear, the Word of God here in verse 13 it does refer to the gospel message that Paul and his companions had spoken. When the Thessalonians heard it, they realized that it wasn't just simply the words of man's wisdom, but it's a message that had its source in God. They sensed the supernatural truthfulness of the gospel that was being spoken and they embraced it. They embraced it, and the Holy Spirit convicted their hearts. See, regardless of how wise it sounds, a person's word, a person's philosophy, a person's own wisdom will never bring this type of conviction. And it will always form a shaky foundation for faith. It's been said that the gospel isn't the kind of message that man would invent if he could. 
nor is it a message that he could invent if he would. See, my friends, the fact is only God can be fully trusted. And it's only when his word is trusted that results are produced in the hearts, in hearts and in lives. It has to be trusted. It has to be received and it has to be trusted. If you want God to really change your life, you got to allow it to come in. you got to receive it. You gotta receive it and, and trust it. And it's then that it will begin to see the you'll see the results. The results are produced in the hearts of hearts and lives. Now Hebrews chapter four, verse twelve explains that process. And there it says, For the word of God, listen carefully, the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When Christians share their faith, if you're a believer here, if you're a Christian and you share your faith, Christians aren't presenting a philosophical viewpoint or a personal opinion or their subjective views on the world and, and, and in, life, in life and in the world we live in. No, you're not. You're not. You're not doing that. You see, if shared properly, we're actually announcing the divinely revealed the divinely revealed truth of God, the spoken word of God that has a power to save and transform lives. Now, it's true. Yes, I know some will receive it and others won't. But those who don't, it reflects on them, not on the message. On this, Spurgeon said, that you have not perceived spiritual things is true, but it is no proof that there is none to perceive. The whole case is like that of an Irishman who tried to upset evidence by non-evidence. Four witnesses saw him commit a murder. He pleaded that he was not guilty and wished to establish his innocence by producing 40 persons who did not see him do it. Of what use would that have been? So if 40 people declare that there is no power of the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost going with the word, this only proves that 40 people do not know what others know. That's the spoken word. In addition to the spoken word, there's also the written word of God. The Bible, it has the power also to transform people's lives. And for this reason, it shouldn't be treated as any other book. The Bible you're holding or you have on your laps is different in origin, character, content, and cost. Every word in that Bible was inspired by the Spirit of God and written by men of God who were used by the Spirit of God. It's holy, pure, and perfect. And it was written at great cost, not only to the writers, but also to Jesus Christ, who became man, so that the word of God may be given to us. You see, Christian, the way you treat your Bible shows your regard 
towards Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain. It's, it's not the, the physical book in itself, but your Bible, the one that you call your personal Bible, that you take notes on, that you read, that you study with, that's how God communicates to you. And we have to remember that Jesus is also called the Word. He is the Word. He was with God in the beginning. That's what 1 John chapter 1 tells us. See, again, He is, Jesus is the living Word. And the Bible is the written Word. But in essence, they're the same. Both are bread. Both are light. And both are truth. The Holy Spirit gave birth to Jesus through a holy woman. And He gave birth to the Bible through the holy men of God. So Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God forever, and the Word of God will live forever. Both will be and live forever. Now for those of you wondering why we here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel put a strong emphasis on reading and studying the Bible, going through it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Why we, if you're wondering why we put a such a strong emphasis, to, we do that as a church and why I encourage that for you to do on your own and also to get together with others for a Bible, for a, for a Bible study. Well, let me tell you why we put a strong emphasis on that. I firmly believe that this Bible, your Bibles that you're holding, is, it is the very Word of God. And that it will radically alter and influence any person who spends time in its pages. you really considered that? Are you struggling with something? Are you going through an issue? Are you going through a problem? Are you just having a really difficult time trying to figure things out? You spend time in God's Word. He will speak to you. If you truly have the Spirit of God living in you, you've been born again and Spirit has made his home in you. He will speak to you. He will show you things. He will tell you that you're not alone. I know that a lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people struggle with loneliness. A lot of people struggle with addictions. A lot of people struggle with, you know, just all kinds of different things. You get into the Word, you study it, you read it, you meditate on it. It will speak powerfully to you. It will show you things that you've never thought of or considered before. And now that's all done by the Holy Spirit. If you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, if you're not, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's just going to seem like any other book. It's going to just be like a textbook and it's going to be hard to, to really try to figure out where to begin. You know, there's all kinds of complicated words. You're going to think back of maybe those old King James Bibles and you're going to be thinking about, you know, well, you know, there's other Bibles that have all kinds of different books in it that aren't in, in this Bible. Yeah, I, but what I'm trying to tell you is these things all come together and the Holy Spirit starts showing you things. And when He starts showing you these things, 
it radically starts, it, it, it radically starts changing your life. Give it a shot. Give it a try if you, you know, do it. Life will change. God wants to change your life. Let me also bring up another point in this verse, verse 13. The Thessalonians' initial acceptance of the message, it was an act of faith. They received it by faith. But by faith, they also obeyed it. They also obeyed the word. And the word went to work in their lives. So by faith they received it, and by faith they obeyed it. And it began, the word began to do a work. See, it's not enough to appreciate the Bible or even, or even appropriate the Bible. We must, we must apply the word in our lives and be the hearers and doers of the Word. The Word of God has in it the power, the power to accomplish the will of God for nothing, as it says in Luke 1.37, nothing is impossible with God. It's been well said that God's commandments are God's enablements. Jesus commanded the crippled man to stretch out his hand, the very thing that that man couldn't do. Yet that word of command gave him the power to obey. He trusted the word. He obeyed it and was made whole. He trusted it. He obeyed it. And as a result, he was made whole. You see, church, when we believe God's word and obey, he releases power, divine energy that works in our lives to fulfill, again, it's important, to fulfill his purpose. Plural sense, his purposes. The word of God within us is a great source of power in times of testing and suffering. Those of you suffering and going through trials and going through difficult times, the Word of God is a great source of power. And so here, here's the thing. Here's how I'll sum up that verse. If we appreciate the Word, heart, appropriate the word, the mind, and apply the word, the will, then the whole person will be controlled by God's word, by God's word, and he, he will give us the victory. He will give you the victory. If you appreciate the word, if you appropriate the word, and apply the word, and the whole person is controlled by God's word, and he will give us the victory. Well, then, in verses 14 through 16, Paul states the results that the word had produced in the lives of the believers in Thessalonica. <laughs> Not only had they been saved, they were enabled to stand firm in the face of severe persecution. That alone, that there was good evidence of the reality of their conversion. By their steadfast endurance, they became imitators of Christian churches in Judea. The only difference was that the Thessalonians suffered at the hands of their Gentile countrymen whereas the believers in Judea were persecuted by the Jews in Judea. 
at this mention of the Judeans, Paul launches into an indictment of them as arch opponents of the gospel. And who should know better than he? At one time, he himself, Paul, had been a ringleader of those Jews who attempted to liquidate the Christian faith. He stood there as Christians were being killed. And then after his conversion, he himself felt the sharp edge of the sword of their persecution. Now, although Paul mentioned that his own countrymen, the Jews that killed the Lord Jesus, he also knew better than anybody else that they weren't, they, uh, weren't the only ones responsible for the murder of Jesus. The Romans had their full share of guilt. So both the Jew and the Gentile were guilty. Now, also, I also noticed that in the middle of verse 15, Paul mentioned the murder of Jesus before mentioning his own persecutions. Now, I personally think he might have done this purposely because in his mind, what Jesus went through was more serious and much more intense than anything he went through. So then... Another question arises, why did the leaders of Israel reject Jesus Christ? And why still to this day do they reject Jesus Christ? But those leaders back then, why did they reject him and persecute his followers? See, the answer is they were only repeating the sins of their fathers. Their ancestors had persecuted the prophets, long before Jesus came to earth. They couldn't see that their law was only a temporary preparation for God's new covenant of grace. And so by rejecting God's truth, they protected their man-made traditions, their religion. The sad thing was that Israel was filling up their sins, as it says in verse 16, and storing up wrath for the day of judgment. This image is used in Genesis chapter 15, verse uh, 16. And Jesus used it in his sermon against the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verse 32. God patiently waits as sinners rebel against him. And he watches as their measure of sin and judgment fills up. And when time's up, and eventually, yes, everybody's cup gets filled. When that time is up, that happens, God's patience will end. And judgment will fall. Again, in particular here, he's speaking of Israel, Jews. Now, in one sense, judgment has already fallen on Israel. Where they were scattered, they were a scattered people, and their nation in Palestine was under Roman rule. But an even greater judgment is to fall in the future, or was to fall in the future. For in AD 70, The Roman armies besieged Jerusalem, destroyed the city and the temple, and ended the period of God's patience with his people during the ministry ministry of the apostles. Although tragic, it's true that the righteous suffered because of the sins of the wicked. Now, Passages such as this, verse 16, 
Some have suggested that Paul was being anti-Semitic and that the New Testament is an anti-Semitic book. They will take verses like this and, and say, I can't believe in the Bible because it speaks out against the Jews. It's an anti-Semitic book. But here's the truth. Paul had a deep, deep love for his countrymen, the Jews. And in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, he even said that he'd be willing to cut, be cut off from Christ if it would have meant their salvation. Although his ministry was primarily to the Gentiles, he never lost his burden for the evangelization of the Jews. At times, this burden almost seems to have taken precedence over his primary mission. Now, what the apostle says here about the Judean leaders is historical fact, not personal thoughts. Remember, God moved them, God inspired them, God led them to write the words that he did. Also, let me add this very important point that I think needs to be said. It isn't said too often. Anti-Semitism, my friends, is unchristian and cannot be justified under any circumstance. You know, people joking around like that, be around it, don't be around it. I've heard the jokes, I've heard the statements that are made and you shouldn't be involved with that. Anti-Semitic is unchristian. It shouldn't be tolerated. It shouldn't come again from Christians. But with that, let me also just say this. Keep this in mind. It isn't anti-Semitic to say that the Jewish people are charged by God with the death of his son, as Acts chapter 2, verse 23 says. Just as the Gentiles are also responsible for their part, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. Those who say, or if you've said that it was the Jews that killed Jesus, you're forgetting, they're forgetting that it was the Gentiles too. Both had a part in his death, in his murder. Not one group of people is purely guilty. In these verses here, Paul was encouraging the suffering Christians by assuring them that their experience weren't new or isolated. Others had suffered before them and even then suffering with them. The churches in Judea had been exterminated. Hadn't been, the churches in Judea hadn't been exterminated by suffering. If anything, they, they had been purified and they thrived. They, they increased. But the persecutors were filling up the measure of wrath to be heaped on their heads. Now, interestingly, interestingly, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says that saints have been saved completely. But here in verse 16, it also says that sinners will experience God's complete wrath. Been saved, com sinners, you're saved complete. I mean, saints, you've been saved completely. Sinners will experience, if they don't repent, 
believe in Jesus, accept them, they will experience God's complete wrath, whether they're Jew or Gentile. Now, also here is one of the great values of the local church. We stand together in times of difficulty and encourage one another. It was when Elijah isolated himself from the other faithful Israelites that he became discouraged and wanted to quit. In light of this, in ch- back when we get to chapter 3, Paul will state that one reason Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica was to encourage the believers there. I, I encourage you, if you can, to, to remember this as a believer. A lonely saint is very vulnerable, very vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. No many Christians who have tried to do it on their own, tried to figure it out on their own. They say they don't need the church, they don't need the fellowship, they don't need to get together, and they isolate themselves. Rather than being part or, you know, going full on um, backslide, backslider, they, they just isolate themselves. They say, I'm not going to be part of that and I'm not going to be part of that. I'm just going to be here. And... But again, it gets lonely. When you're lonely like that, you're vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. Jesus went through it out in the desert. He was attacked, but he knew the word. And what did he do immediately after he was tempted? Went out and started having fellowship. That was part of the plan. That was part of Jesus' plan. Don't, you know, assume that that's your plan as well. What I'm saying here is, again, when you isolate yourself, you're going to be vulnerable to the tax of Satan. And the point, my point, the point I'm making is that we need each other. We need each other in the battles of life. We're supposed to be here for one another, encourage one another, uplift one another, take on our, each other's burdens, pray for one another. How can that happen when, how can that happen believer isolates themselves and no one knows what's going on they're assuming that oh someone will come and check on me and you know that's not always the case you know people do care they want to know what's happening if you're here and as a believer you're a christian and you don't care then you know, check your heart and ask yourself, why don't I care about what they're going through? It's my brother, that's my sister. We're a family in God. All right, let me move on. Well, in the last four verses that we're about to read, the apostle will explain his failure to return to Thessalonica and his Thessalonica and his deep desire to want to see them and be with them. So let's pick up our Bibles again. The Word of God. That's why usually when I begin my reading, I, I always say the Word of God says because I really do believe this is the Word of God. But anyways, let's pick up in verse 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. But as for us, brothers and sisters, after we were forced to leave you for a short time, in person, not in heart, we greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you face to face. 
So we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For who is our hope? Or for who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at this coming? At his coming? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Paul first makes it clear that the separation is only physical. The expression, having been taken away from you, means that they were orphaned by the departure of their spiritual father. However, his affectionate interest in them had never waned. Notice that he expresses how he expresses the intensity of his love towards them. We greatly desired and made every effort. Then in verse 18, he explains how twice he had tried to go back to Thessalonica, but twice Satan had hindered him. Paul, in all his apostolic ministry and authority, he could still be blocked by Satan. But Paul didn't just receive this satanic hindrance in a fatalistic way. He just didn't say, man, forget it. Satan's blocking me. That's, that's it. You know, ministry's done. Forget about it. I'm going home. No. He did something about the hindrance. First, Paul understood that this was a satanic hindrance. He knew this wasn't a random circumstance, but a direct attack from Satan. Paul had the discernment to know. Second, Paul had faith. For a short time, means that Paul knew that it would only be for a short time until the roadblock, roadblock was overcome. Third, Paul was committed to fight against the roadblock any way he could. If he couldn't be there in person, this letter that we're reading will go for him and teach and encourage Thessalonian believers in his absence. The Thessalonian believers in his absence. And finally, God brought victory. Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, describes Paul's eventual return to Thessalonica and to other churches in the area. Here's something else that Spurgeon said. Supposing that we have ascertained that hindrances in our way really come from Satan, what then? I have but one piece of advice, and that's to go on, hindrance or no hindrance, in the path of duty is God the Holy Ghost. In the path of duty as God's Holy Ghost enables you. Keep going. Satan's hindering you, you know it's him and he's keeping you doing something, being a part of something. Be... Again, have the discernment to know it's him. It's only temporary. But again, just keep going, keep doing, find other ways to go around that roadblock Satan has made. There will be other ways. So why was the apostle, why was Paul so interested in going back to the Thessalonian believers? Well, verse 19 answers that question. Because they were his children in the Lord. He had pointed them to Christ and felt responsible for their spiritual growth. He knew that he would have to give an account of them in a future yet to come. 
They were his hope of reward at the judgment seat of Christ. He wanted to be able to rejoice in them. They would be his crown of rejoicing before the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Now, it seems obvious from this verse that Paul expected to recognize the Thessalonians in heaven. He expected to recognize those believers in heaven. And so it follows that we too, we too will know our loved ones in heaven. This is one of those verses show us that we will know and recognize all those people that we cared about and loved that were believers. So that ought to give you hope as well. If you know and have loved someone that is with the Lord already, don't let anyone tell you you will never see them again. You know, keep in mind, the Bible does tell us that we're, there will be a, a marriage, a big old marriage supper feast or a feast. We're all going to be there. With Jesus, with the Lord, as I said, we will recognize one another. That should be motivation for you. If you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, that, uh, that in itself should be a, a motivation for you to give Christ the opportunity to come to the cross and accept Him. Especially if you don't know where you're going to be, what's going to happen after you breathe your last breath. I believe that I will see my mother one day, even though up until, she, up until last day she was a professing Catholic that had a bunch of images of Mary and all kinds of things in her house. And, but I believe that when I shared the gospel to her in those last few moments of her life, she accepted. And I wish I could tell you how and how I know that. The Lord gave me that peace. And also, when he gave me that peace, it wasn't long after that that she did breathe her last breath. So yes, I'm looking forward to seeing her. I'm looking forward to also one day seeing my wife and my children and my friends, all of you. Like, yeah, we made it here. It's going to be such a cool day. In this verse, also, Paul speaks of his children in the faith as being his crown. In other places in the New Testament, we read of other crowns. The crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4.8. The crown of life in James chapter 1, verse 12 and, James, and Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. The crown of glory in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. All of them incorruptible. Notice, though, that Paul didn't say, he didn't say that he would receive a crown. He said that the saints themselves would be his crown when he met them at the judgment seat. Both these letters, both First and, and Second Thessalonians will show that some of the believers in the church were not living as they should, and some were even a burden to Paul. But when he looked ahead, when he looked at the future glory, he saw them in glory. They brought joy to his heart. However, this joy of greeting believers in heaven also brings with it a solemn warning. We will lose joy if we go to heaven empty-handed. The Christian who hasn't sincerely tried to win others to Christ or has led 
people to the cross will not experience this glory and joy when Jesus returns. You will experience other joys and glories, but this particular joy and glory of leading people to Christ, you won't know what that's like. And I know that I want to experience every single kind of joy and glory the Lord has to offer. The Lord will hand out. And I hope that's your desire as well. It's not enough, as chapter 1, verse 10 says, to just wait for His Son. We must also witness for God and work for His Son so that when we get to heaven, we will have all the trophies to present for His glory. I imagine... This is just, again, a, a, a thought, but, you know, the, a wall full of trophies, right? There's only one missing, and that's the witnessing one. That's the one that's missing. You, you could have, that wall could have been filled, and it will be filled, but that one is missing. You should have that desire to have that wall filled. I'm just saying, I know I do. That's why I'm here. That's why I also share the gospel afterwards and, you know, to those who are here and watching and listening. It's the trophy of the gospel. And again, you'll be presenting that. Uh, oh, that'll be presented for His glory. According to Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, there's a special joy and reward for the soul winner. There's also a crown for the believer who subdues his body and keeps it controlled for the glory of God. Galatians chapter 5 verse 23 says that self-control self is produced by the Spirit. Now since our bodies are God's temple, we must be careful not to defile them. There's several ways you can defile that body. But I know that the Bible, it's very explicit when it talks about giving it over to, to idols and to prostitutes. Prostituting your body and handing it over to, as though it was just a piece of meat. Since our bodies are God's temples, your body is God's temple. Remember that. Those of you that are young, your body is God's temple. You must be careful not to defile it. There's going to be a lot of people out there who want to defile your body, who want to take advantage of you. Take care of what God has given you. You're precious in His sight. He created every single fiber of your body and He loves you and cares for you and He lives inside of you. God lives inside of you and that's you're His temple. Don't defile it with just anything with anyone, with drugs, Excesses, excesses. Careful not to allow idols to come in there. The ultimate in giving the body to God is dying for His sake. And for this, there's a crown. Those who lovingly look for Christ's appearing will receive a crown of righteousness. Again, it says that in 2 Timothy 4.8. Now, let me also say this. As believers, 
We must never look on, a f on future rewards as means for showing up the other saints. You get that? It's not these rewards aren't for you to, be, to brag about and say, hey, you know, look at all my trophies. Look what I've done. Here, look, look what I've accomplished. No, it's not what it's for. Like the elders described in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, a picture of the glorified church, we will worship the Lord. And then what are we going to do? We're going to lay our crowns. All those crowns, we're going to lay them at His feet. After all, our work, our work was done in His power and for His glory. So He deserves all the praise. The fact that God promises rewards to us is another evidence of His grace. God could demand our service simply on the basis of all that He's done for us. Our, mo our motive, however, for serving Him is love. In His grace, He gives us rewards so that we may have something to give Him in return. When the, when the Christians at Thessalonica read this letter, it must have just encouraged them tremendously. They were going through intense persecution and suffering, and perhaps some of them were tempted to give up. Don't give up, Paul encouraged them. Lay hold of the spiritual resources you have in Jesus Christ. You have the Word of God within you, the people of God around you, and the glory of God before you. There is no need to give up. Yes, we've been beaten up in the city, writes Paul. Yes, we've been chased down by envious Jews. Yes, we're going through real persecution. But it's all worth it. It's all worth it because you're getting saved. Church, the greatest joy in the world comes from seeing someone from, for whom you've been praying and to whom you've been witnessing receive Christ. Let me put that in a more simpler way. There is no greater joy than seeing that person you've been praying for all those years, for many, many years, receive Jesus Christ. Man, what a joy. I have people that I'm, I've seen it happen, and, and I have people in my life now, family members, I'm praying for. And I, I know how happy I'm going to be. The day they tell me I've received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I imagine just tears rolling down my cheeks but tears of joy, tears of happiness. No wonder Jesus tells us that when one person is saved, all of heaven breaks out in rejoicing. Truly, joy and evangelism go hand in hand. Thus, my prayer is that we would never lose sight of the privilege, priority, and pure joy of sharing the good news with simply who don't know Jesus, with, with, with people who don't know Jesus. So that's what I'd like to do right now as I end this message. If you've never been forgiven of your sins and you want to be forgiven, I want to lead you to the cross where Jesus died for all of your sins. He suffered there. And when he took on your sin, you were made holy in God's eyes. This, the, also the shackles of sin and death were removed. So if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to be born again,
wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and pray this with the full sincerity of your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe now that you died for my sins and and three days later you rose from the dead. And now I repent and turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for, for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you, Jesus, to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me, instruct me, and lead me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, thank you for... Um, praying that prayer. And, and I want to, now as your brother in the Lord, I want to welcome you into the, to the family of God. I want to help you in your next steps. If you need that, let us know. We want to, let us know. We can help you in any way we can. Um, if you need a, a church, we can help you find a church. If you're here locally, we want to invite you here at the, at our church in the northeast, northeast El Paso, corner of Gateway South and Hondo Pass. Small little church, but full of love, and you'll definitely learn the Word of God here. You won't get the fluff, and you won't get the, the smoke and any, any of that. You'll get simply the Word of God. A true, you, you'll be worshiping, and you'll also be hearing the Word of God. So I invite you to come join us. Thank you for watching that are aren't local, but are just happen to check out this video. Thank you, and I hope this message encouraged you. I pray that it did. It changed your life. If you believe that it may change the lives of others, please share it. Um, I'm not going to go out there and or tell you to subscribe and any of that or press the thumbs up button. No, I'm just going to share it. Yeah, someone who needs to hear it. Be that messenger. I um, hope you have a great day. I hope you're a blessing to others this week. For now, goodbye. I love you. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.